Our text for this morning is John 15, 11. It says, These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. I'm going to talk a little bit about what these things that our Lord was speaking about in, in, in my message as we go through. But uh, there is one small correction I want to make in your, in your bulletin. It says that our, our mark of maturity that we're looking at this morning is joy, and we are. But there's a word that was missing, and, and it's one that I hadn't given to Cheryl, so it wasn't, that wasn't on her, that was on me. The actual title is Perennial Joy. And uh, we're going to see what that means. I've preached a lot over the years about joy and about finding joy. And when I was studying through these marks of maturity, I realized that this joy that we're going to talk about, we already have. We just need to cultivate it. And so um, with all of that in mind, let's, uh, let's take a look at this uh, this morning. Author Leo Buscaglia tells this story about his mother and their misery dinner. It was the night after his father came home and said it looked as if he would have to go into bankruptcy because his partner had, had absconded with their firm's funds. His mother went out and sold some jewelry to buy food for a, for a sumptuous feast. Other members of the family scolded her for it, but she told them that the time for joy is now when we need it most, not next week. Her courageous act rallied the family. So this fifth mark of maturity is a deep perennial joy. And to put it bluntly, a Christian who is consistently sad or morose is immature. He or she has not learned to draw from the spring of eternal joy that we find in God that we've accepted in Christ and that lives with us in the Spirit. I'm not speaking about those times that we all have when we fall into a low mood or we have a struggle with depression or we're wrestling with something and, and we might even have weeks at a time of this. I'm talking about consistently. I'm talking about the norm being sad or morose, more often than not. The general climate of the Christian's heart is that of joy. The Christian writer Rendell Harris, no relation that I know of, says that joy is the strength of the people of God. It is their chief characteristic. Think about that this morning. Joy is the strength of the people of God. It is our chief characteristic. Hugh says, there is no joy. There is no Christian. Where there is no joy, there is no Christian faith. And where there is Christian faith, there is joy. There is this connection. There is this link between salvation, Christian faith, and joy. In Acts 8, verses 4 to 25, we read of, of the time when Philip went down to Samaria and he preached Christ to the people. And in verse 22, it says, there was great joy in that city as they heard, as they believed. See, Christ and joy go together. No matter what reasons that we have or how we explain why there isn't any joy in our lives, it's not the way God intended it. If we're living our lives without joy and we're calling ourselves Christians, it's not how God intended us to live. We need always remember that when we are linked to Jesus, we are in the presence of joy. A young Christian describing her reactions to being converted said in her first testimony meeting, first testimony, the thing that has struck me about being a Christian 
is how little it takes to make us happy when we know Jesus. And how little it took to make me unhappy when I didn't. The truth is so profound and out of the mouths of a baby Christian. As we know, joy is quite different from happiness. Happiness depends on what happens. If what happens is good, if what happens is happy, then we're happy. But joy bubbles up even when things don't go happily. Think of that image for a second. Joy bubbles up. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but an awful lot of people out there today believe that when a person becomes a Christian, they live a life of misery. Nietzsche, the philosopher, once said that Christians would have to look more redeemed if he was going to be drawn toward the Christian message. Personally, I was raised in a church that struggled to enjoy worshiping God. So I'm probably not the poster child for the joyful Christian life because that's not how I was raised. We live in the Northeast and in the Northeast we're called the frozen chosen or the chosen frozen, depending upon how you want to. And other than our Pentecostal brothers and sisters, a lot of churches in the Northeast, um, we don't jump around and we don't, we're, not, we're not overly exuberant. Sometimes. I mean, there's a cross at the heart of our faith. And following Christ requires self-denial. And we take those things seriously. But God himself told us that a fruit of the Spirit inside of us is joy, according to Galatians 5.22. It's one of the spiritual fruits In fact, in the list, I think it's second. Love, joy, peace. We're summoned to rejoice. We're asked, we're told to rejoice no less than 70 times in the New Testament. When you go back and you look at the Pentecost, joy was evident in that very first hour of the Spirit's descent. One commentator says, honest men at Pentecost thought that the apostles were drunk. And whenever living water has burst forth from the rock again, the same exuberant gladness has been manifested. The early Franciscans had it, the early Methodists, the early Salvationists, all of them had it. Think back to your day that you were saved. If you can pinpoint, a lot of Christians can't, but if you're one of those who can, you can go back and pinpoint that day when you gave your life to the Lord. Do you remember the exuberance? Do you remember the, the peace and the joy that flooded your soul? That's all still there. Sadly, these excessive demonstrations of joy are disapproved of in many places nowadays. As another verse from Galatians 5 is quoted, but the fruit of the Spirit is also self-control. I wonder what would happen right here in Ashland if joy were to break out among us in the way that it was recorded in the Scriptures. Certainly, there would be family, friends, and neighbors who would disapprove of our exuberant joy. But I wonder, would, be, would we be closer to the maturity that God is drawing us to if we allowed ourselves to just kick back and have fun and be joyous? It's important for us to see that Christian joy is completely independent of health, wealth, or any kind of circumstance. It appears when strength and friends and health have failed us. Joy is there even when circumstances are not just unkind, but savage. So we've set, spent 10 months behind masks and locked away in our homes. And 
How much joy have we experienced in the midst of all of that? Does that come bubbling up through? W.B. Hornby in his book, Great Christians, tells of men and women who, despite the most difficult circumstances and problems, how they demonstrated a joy that could only be described as supernatural. He tells of one in particular, Father Brown, who organized a mission in Calcutta. Although crippled by a horrible and a painful disease, he would arrive at every meeting peeling with laughter. One of the most memorable sermons, says those who heard him, was on the theme of gladness of heart. Another minister tells of coming out of church one Sunday evening after an evening service in which the power of the Lord had been greatly manifested in the body. As the people dispersed, the awful hush of, his, of the Lord's presence was still upon them. They were just seemingly floating in the power of the Spirit as they headed home. And as he was locking things down and going to his car, a crowded coach with revelers from the seaside stopped by for a moment. They were held up by the busy traffic of all the people leaving the church and heading home. And one of the coach party, flushed with drink and wearing a paper cap and a false nose, shouted, why don't you enjoy yourself? The pastor realized something. Many of the people in that coach who believed that they were enjoying themselves better than the pastor in his church were going to wake up the next morning with hangovers. Yet the church people who experienced tremendous joy would wake up the next morning with that one. Truly what the scriptures Tell us when it says to be found drunk in the spirit and not in the spirits. But what of our text? That's all my introduction. What of our text? Our text is really driving at that very idea. Not just about the spirits and drinking and all of those things. But in John 15, we see Jesus speaking about being in the vine, about God being the vine dresser, about us abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in us and that relational peace that is just like this. It's how in the New Testament we came to move away from the God who, who intercedes and interjects himself into our lives to a relationship with Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. It's this kind of a relationship. If we're not tied into that vine, we're not going to feel that joy because the joy is not flowing in us and through us. It's not there, ready to bubble up. Christ spoke of all of these things so that his joy would be in us and our joy would be complete. How does his joy get into us? when we get grafted into the vine. It's part of the sap that's flowing through us, spiritually speaking. The joy that comes from God, says one commentator, is part of the Christian's armor. Not trying to change metaphors, but well, what does he mean by that? He means that sin insinuates itself much more easily into the downcast heart than into a joyous spirit. Jealousy, for example, finds a lodging place very quickly in a heart that's unsatisfied, and, and the desire for revenge requires the harboring of a grudge. The joy that comes from Jesus should end all that. One Christian says, from the hour the Holy Spirit came into my heart, People I had hated before because of some real or imagined dis... I know what the word is I used. I don't know why I used the word I put in there. Some real or imagined issue with them. I had suffered at their hands, were quickly forgiven and forgotten. 
Let me use a different image. Germs will much more easily infect a body that is run down or debilitated or dis despondent. Scientific fact. The termites of the soul work the same way. They enter without ceremony and they eat away the health of the soul. Situations like we've been in for the past few months, this pandemic, are wonderful breeding grounds for this kind of activity to, to take place in our souls. Victor Franco, that wonderful courageous man who was able to survive the, the Holocaust because he happened to be Jewish, spoke of a patient of his. He said that when blood serum was taken at a time of joyful excitement, the agglutination teeter against typhus bacilli was found to be enormously higher than when blood was taken from the same subject, subject in a saddened state. In other words, when the patient was sad, his body would have been more susceptible to being sick from typhus than when he was joyful. So it seems that science, science underscores what God's word is telling us, that it's extremely healthy for us to be joyful. How then can we have more joy? That's a question that I've asked many, many times from this pulpit. And there isn't really any mystery about it. The lack of joy is caused almost entirely through inner conflicts and wrong attitudes. When we get rid of these inner conflicts by putting our lives fully in the hands of Jesus, we will automatically experience, burst into joy. There's a force at work out there, like the germs spoken of, of earlier, that are seeking to quell our joy at the source. It's eating away at our souls. If we haven't learned anything in this pandemic, we should have learned that, the reality of that, that there is an entity, there's a force at work out there. Someone Hughes speaks of a situation when he was called into to help a, as a Christian counselor. He said, I was called in to assist a Christian union meeting where some Christians had fallen out with each other and would not work together. He said, what should have been a meeting where joy was manifested became a meeting of gloom. The members called themselves a Christian union, but some very unchristian rebel elements were at work. When these matters were faced and dealt with, then joy returned to the group and they were a true union once again. It's the same with us, he says, when the rebellious elements within us are surrendered to Jesus and we become inwardly one with him by surrendering who we are, then a deep joy is ours. I read of an archaeologist who came across an old document showing the location of a spring in a certain part of the city of Rome. He obtained permission to dig beneath the foundations of an ancient building, and after months of removing dirt and rubble, there was the spring. It burst upwards through the last remaining stones as if glad that it had been found. Joy is like that. When we get rid of the rubble that clutters up our lives, then joy bursts upwards automatically. We can't help it. So what do we do with all of this? Some wonderful words. Maybe even some slight applications. But this morning as we are preparing for communion, this is a time when we can make those adjustments, we can make those changes. Think back. I'm not talking 10 months. Think back over your life. 
Does joy one of the words that you would that you would describe your life as? Is it joyful? Do we enjoy living? I know we it, it seems the older I'm getting, the more grumbling and complaining I'm, I'm getting. And people tell me that's normal. And yet God says, I'm to be filled with joy. I did. I tried something as I was in preparation for this. I, I, I did an experiment this week. I told you when we started this whole series, the very first thing that we needed to deal with was the understanding that we get choice. We can choose. And I will tell you right now, you can't choose joy. How can I be so definitive about that? Because that's exactly what I did this week. Every day, every morning, I got up in the morning and as I was heading to my bus garage to pick up my bus, whether that was at 5.30 in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, whatever time it was, my prayer was, God, I choose joy today. I don't care how tired I am. I don't care how sore I am. I don't care how nasty the kids got. I choose joy. And you know what? It works. You can choose joy. And it will bubble up. It's there waiting. I, I, I think about that bubbling up. And it's funny because my first time when I was reading through and studying this and ty typing that up, I thought, kind of like a spring. But God wants it to be like a volcano. Whenever we think about our emotions in a volcano, we always think of anger. And God said, don't think of anger. Think of joy as a volcano. And let's erupt joy over everyone. But let's begin by taking a look at ourselves and asking God, is there any rubble that needs to be cleaned away so that that joy will pop out like that fountain? Let's bow together and let's talk to him. Father, I know in my own life I have attitudes that I've been wrestling with for a long time. And Father, you have been ever the gracious and, and wonderful God that you are. And Lord, I, I thank you for continuing to show these areas in my life that need to be fixed and need to be addressed so that that joy will be there. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, listening over the broadcast, Lord. I pray, Father, that uh, we might all recognize the rubble that needs to be pushed aside so that that joy can flow out. Father, we enjoy one another, we love one another, we're brothers and sisters. But Father, sometimes the daily rigors of life make it hard to express that and to show it. And so, Lord, help us to, to begin that process even now as we're gathered and preparing to be around the, the communion table. Father, may you touch us. May you strengthen us. And may we feel that joy that you have for each one of us, that it might be complete in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.